Part One, Chapter One of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire by Henriette Lucie de la Tour du Pin Gouvernet, edited, abridged, and translated by Walter Gere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Whoever writes a book almost always does so with the idea that it will be read either before or after his death but i do not intend to write a book merely the journal of my life if i were only to relate events a few sheets of paper would suffice for a record of so little interest but if i undertake to set forth the history of my opinions and my feelings the journal of my heart the enterprise is more difficult for to depict one's self self-knowledge is essential and one does not begin to acquire that at fifty years of age perhaps i shall speak of the past and tell the story of my early years only in episodes and without continuity i do not pretend to write my confessions but although i should dislike to reveal my faults i wish nevertheless to depict myself as i am and as i have been i have never written anything except letters to those i love i have no order in my ideas and little method my memory is already much impaired moreover my imagination carries me sometimes so far from the subject i wish to follow that it is difficult for me to pick up the threads so often broken by these digressions my heart is still so young that i have to look at myself in the mirror to realize that i am no longer twenty years of age let me then take advantage of the ardour which still remains and which the infirmities of age may sweep away at any moment to relate some facts of a troubled life but one not so unhappy from the events known to the public as from the secret afflictions known only to god Childhood of Mademoiselle Dillon During my earliest years I was a witness of many incidents which should have debased my mind, perverted and corrupted my heart, and destroyed in me every idea of morality and religion. From the age of ten I was present when the conversation was most free, and heard expressed the most ungodly principles. I was brought up in the house of an archbishop where all the rules of religion were daily violated i knew from observation that i was taught dogmas and doctrines exactly as i was instructed in history and geography my mother had married her cousin arthur dillon with whom she had been brought up and whom she regarded only as a brother she was very beautiful and the angelic sweetness of her character caused her to be loved by everybody men adored her and women were not jealous of her although free from coquetry she was not sufficiently reserved in her relations with men who took her fancy and who the world said were in love with her one of her admirers in particular spent his entire life in the house of my grandmother and of my uncle the archbishop where my mother lived he also went to the country with us. The Prince de Gaminet, nephew of the notorious Cardinal de Rohan, was therefore considered by everybody as my mother's lover. But I do not think this was true, for the Duc de Lausanne, the Duc de Liancourt, and the Comte de Saint-Blancard were equally attentive to her. The Comte de Fersen, who was reputed to be the lover of Queen Marie Antoinette, also came to our house nearly every day, my mother took the fancy of the queen who was always impressed by brilliancy madame dillon was much in vogue and for this reason only she entered the royal household and became a dame du palais at that time i was seven or eight years of age my grandmother who was a woman of very haughty character and of infinite ill-nature running frequently into a rage enjoyed nevertheless the affections of her daughter my mother was absolutely under her control 
entirely dependent upon her mother in money matters, she had never dared to point out that as the only daughter of her father, General de Roth, who died when she was fifteen years old, she had the right to control her own fortune. My grandmother had taken possession arbitrarily da vive force of the domain of Hautefontaine, which had been purchased with the funds of her husband. Daughter of a peer of England of slender fortune, she had received a very small inheritance. But my mother, married at seventeen years of age to a man of eighteen who had been brought up with her, and who had no property except his regiment, could never find the courage to talk to my grandmother of money matters. The Queen opened her eyes to her interests and encouraged her to demand an accounting. My grandmother was furious, and in place of maternal tenderness, became possessed of an inconceivable rage, such as you find described only in romances or tragedies. My earliest recollections are of the frightful scenes between my mother and my grandmother, which I was obliged to appear not to notice. Reserve and discretion on my part were absolutely necessary. I contracted the habit of hiding my feelings. I remember that I was shocked by the way in which my mother complained to her friends of my grandmother. My father naturally took the part of my mother, but I knew that he was under great pecuniary obligations to my uncle the Archbishop, and his position to me seemed false. These reflections developed ideas and experiences which were too precocious in the head of a child of ten years. I never had any infancy. The only person who saved me from these bad influences and encouraged the thoughts of virtue in my heart was a maid who could neither read nor write. She was a young peasant by the name of Marguerite from the neighbourhood of Compiègne. She was very devoted to me and remained in my service nearly all of her life. I knew that Marguerite was worthy of all confidence, and that she would rather die than compromise me by an indiscreet word. The manners and customs of society have changed so much since the Revolution, that I wish to retrace in some detail what I recall of the mode of life of my family. My great-uncle, the Archbishop of Narbonne, rarely visited his diocese. President ex officio of the States of Languedoc, he visited this province solely to preside over the meetings of the States, which were in session six weeks during the months of November and December. As soon as the meeting was over, he returned to Paris, under the pretext that the interests of his province imperiously demanded his presence at the court. But in reality, in order to live en grand seigneur at Paris, and as a courtier, at Versailles. Besides the Archbishopric of Narbonne, which paid him 250,000 francs a year, he had an abbey which was worth 110,000, still another which was worth 90,000, and he received an allowance of more than 50,000 francs for giving dinners every day during the meetings of the States. It would seem that with such an income he should have been able to live honourably and at his ease, but nevertheless he was always in financial difficulties. His style of life at Paris was noble but simple, and the daily fare, although abundant, was reasonable. At this epoch, grand dinners were never given, because everyone dined at an early hour, at two thirty or three o'clock at the latest. The ladies were sometimes coiffées, but never dressed for dinner. The men, on the contrary, were usually dressed in embroidered or plain costumes, according to their age or taste, but almost never in evening dress or in uniform. Those who were not going out in the evening, and the master of the house, were in formal dress and en negligé, for the necessity of putting on a hat deranged the fragile edifice of the curled and powdered toupee. After dinner there was general conversation, or sometimes a game of backgammon. The ladies then retired to dress, and the men awaited them to go to the theatre, 
if they were to be in the same loge. Those who remained at home received visitors during the afternoon. At 9.30 in the evening, the guests arrived for supper. The supper was the real event of the day in society. There were two kinds of suppers, those given by the persons who had them every day, which permitted a certain number of persons to drop in when they wished, and the more formal affairs which were more brilliant and more numerously attended, and to which the guests were invited. I speak of the period of my infancy, from 1778 to 1784. I never attended one of these fine suppers, but have often seen my mother dressing to go to one at the Hôtel de Choiseul or the Palais Royal. At this time there were fewer balls than later. The costumes worn by the ladies naturally turned dancing into a kind of torture. Every one wore heels three inches high, which put the foot in an unnatural position. A pannier of heavy, stiff whalebone extended to the right and the left. A coiffure, a foot high, surmounted by a bonnet called pouf, upon which feathers, flowers and diamonds were piled up, besides a pound of powder and pomade, which the least movement caused to fall upon the shoulders. Such a scaffolding rendered it impossible to dance with pleasure. But at the suppers, where everybody talked or enjoyed a little music, this edifice was not disturbed. But to return to my family. We went to the country early in the spring for the whole summer. At the Chateau of Hautefontaine there were twenty-five apartments for guests, and these were often filled. The principal season, however, was during the month of October. It was then that the colonels came back from their regiments, where they had passed four months less the number of hours necessary to return to Paris, from which city they scattered to the different chateau to visit their families and their friends. At Hautefontaine there was a hunting establishment, the expense of which was divided between my uncle, the Prince de Guémenet, and the Duc de Lausanne. I have heard it said that the expense did not exceed 30,000 francs, but in this sum was not included the outlay for the saddle horses of the masters, only the dogs, the wages of the huntsmen, who were English, their horses, and the keep of the whole establishment. The hunt was held during the summer and autumn in the forests of Compiègne and Villa Cotre. The hunt establishment was kept on such a scale that the poor King Louis the Sixteenth was seriously jealous. At the age of seven I took part in the hunt once or twice a week, and when I was ten years old, the day of St. Hubert, I broke my leg. They tell me that I showed great courage, and did not make a complaint, though it was necessary to carry me five leagues on a stretcher. My first visit to Versailles was at the time of the birth of the first Dauphin, in October 1781. How often the recollection of these days of splendour of Marie Antoinette comes to my mind, when I think of the torments and ignominies of which he was afterwards the unfortunate victim. I went to see the ball given by the Garde du Corps in the Grande Salle de Spectacle in the Chateau of Versailles. The Queen opened the ball with a simple young guard. She was dressed in a blue gown all sprinkled with sapphires and diamonds beautiful, young, adored by all, having just given a dauphin to France, not dreaming of the possibility of a backward step in her brilliant career, she was already on the edge of the abyss. I shall not undertake to describe the intrigues of the court, which my great youth prevented me from judging or even comprehending. I heard it said at the time that the Queen had commenced to take a fancy to Madame de Polignac, who was very pretty, but had little animation. Her sister-in-law, the Comtesse Diane de Polignac, who was older and very intrigante, advised her as to the means of securing the royal favour. I recall that Monsieur de Guémenet endeavoured to warn my mother of this growing favour of Madame de Polignac, 
but my mother accepted the queen's love without thinking to profit by her favour either to augment her own fortune or to make that of her friends she felt that she was already attacked by the malady from which she was to perish less than two years later at this time my father was in america at the head of the first battalion of his regiment the dillon regiment had entered the service of france in sixteen ninety at the time that james the second had lost all hope of remounting the throne after the battle of the boyne the regiment was commanded at that time by my great-grandfather arthur dillon end of part one chapter one Part one chapter two of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a Librivox recording, or Librivox recordings are in the public domain. seventeen eighty two to seventeen eighty three Death of Madame Dillon. My mother had always been delicate since the birth of her son, who died at the age of two years. She did not take any care of her health. She rode horseback, hunted the stag, and sang with the celebrated Piccini, who was a great admirer of her voice. Finally, about the month of April 1782, at the age of thirty-one, she had a hemorrhage. My grandmother, who did not wish to believe in the sickness of her daughter, was at last forced to admit that she was seriously ill my mother consulted a physician who then enjoyed a great deal of celebrity and he ordered her to go to spa it would be difficult to describe the inconceivable rage of my grandmother at the idea that her daughter was going to the springs she did not wish to accompany her there and refused her money for the journey i think that the queen came to my mother's help on this occasion we set out from Hautefontaine for Brussels, where we passed a month. My uncle, Charles Dillon, had married Miss Phipps, the daughter of Lord Mulgrave. He resided at Brussels, as he was not able to live in England on account of his numerous debts. At this time he was still a Catholic. It was only later that he had the unpardonable feebleness to change his religion and become a Protestant in order to inherit from his maternal great-uncle lord lichfield who made this a condition of his heritage of fifteen thousand pounds sterling lady charles Dillon was very beautiful the year before she had visited paris with lady ken mare my father's sister who was also a great beauty she went to the queen's ball with my mother and the three sisters-in-law were generally admired a year had hardly passed before they were in their tombs all three died at an interval of one week as i have already said i did not have any infancy at twelve years of age my education was already far advanced i had read much but without discrimination from the age of seven i had been given an instructor he was an organist of Bézières named com he was engaged to give me lessons on the clavecin for at that time pianos were very rare my mother had one to accompany her voice but i was not permitted to touch it i had always had a great desire to improve my mind i wished to know everything from the cuisine to experiments in chemistry which i made with the little apothecary who lived at hautefontaine the gardener was english and my maid marguerite took me every day to see his wife who taught me to read in that language generally robinson crusoe of which i was very fond at eleven years of age my mother finding that i was not speaking english as well as formerly engaged for me an english maid who was expressly brought over from england her arrival caused me great chagrin as i was separated from my former maid marguerite returning to my story at brussels we stayed in the house of my aunt she was in the last stages of consumption but the disease had not impaired her beauty which was really heavenly she had two charming children a boy of four who afterwards became viscount dillon 
and a girl who later became the wife of Sir Thomas Webb. I had a great deal of fun with these children. My greatest pleasure was to care for them and put them to sleep. I already had the maternal instinct. I felt that these poor children would soon be deprived of their mother. I did not realise that I myself was so near the same misfortune. My mother took me to see Archduchess Marie Christine, who governed the Low Countries with her husband, Duke Albert of Saxe Teschen. While my mother was talking with the Archduchess, they showed me a cabinet in which there were portfolios of prints. I've often thought since that this was the beginning of that superb collection of engravings, the finest in Europe, which Duke Albert left to the Archduke Charles. From Brussels we went to Spa, where Monsieur de Guéminet rejoined us. It was at Spa that I enjoyed for the first time the dangerous poison of praise and success. The days that there were dancers at the assembly room, my mother took me there, and the dancing of the Petite Française soon became one of the curiosities of Spa. The Comte and Comtesse du Nord had just arrived from the interior of Russia, and they had never seen a girl of twelve years dance the gavotte and the minuet. This same princess later became the second wife of the Emperor Paul I of Russia, and thirty-seven years later, when she met me again as a grave mother of a family, she had not forgotten the little girl of other days. At that time she said many pleasant things regarding the recollection she had preserved of my grace, and above all, of my beautiful figure. However, the waters of Spa shortened the days of my poor mother. Nevertheless, she disliked to return to Hautefontaine, as she was certain that she would be greeted there by my grandmother as usual with scenes of ill nature. But my mother had the thought common to all those who were attacked by this cruel malady of the chest, that she should have a change of air. She wished to go to Italy, and asked first to return to Paris. My grandmother consented, and then, for the first time, fully realised the unfortunate state of her daughter. On her arrival at Paris, my grandmother gave my mother her own apartment, as it was the largest in the house. During her last moments, my mother was well cared for. The Queen came to see her, and every day a groom or page was sent from Versailles to inquire regarding her. She grew feebler from day to day. In writing these lines, after forty-five years, I still have a feeling of regret that nobody spoke of the sacraments of the Church, or thought of sending for a priest. In this house of an archbishop, there was not even a chaplain. My mother did not realise that the end was so near. The 7th of September, 1782, she died in the arms of my maid. A good old friend of my mother's, Madame Nagle, brought me the sad news. In the morning I awoke to find her beside my bed. She told me that my grandmother had left the house, and that I should get up and follow her, and ask for her protection and care, that now I depended on her for my future. She said that my grandmother was on bad terms with my father, who was then in America, and that she might disinherit me. My young heart, which was nearly broken, revolted at the idea of this dissimulation and the good lady had much trouble in persuading me to allow her to take me to my grandmother. At last I consented, and as I expected, my grandmother made a great scene of despair which produced a most painful impression on me. After the death of my mother, my grandmother and my uncle went in the month of October 1782 to Hautefontaine and took me with them as well as my instructor, Monsieur Combe, who occupied himself exclusively with my education. I was very fond of this chateau, which I knew would one day belong to me. It was a beautiful estate, all 
en domaine about twenty-two leagues from paris between ville cotteret and soissons the chateau built towards the beginning of the previous century was situated upon a very steep hill it overlooked a fertile little valley or rather gorge opening out upon the forest of compiegne which formed an amphitheatre at the back of the picture prairies woods ponds of clear water filled with fish were situated beyond a fine kitchen garden which you overlooked from the windows of the chateau the chateau itself although it had no architectural beauty was convenient vast perfectly furnished and well cared for in every detail my uncle my grandmother and my mother had accompanied my father as far as brest when he embarked in seventeen seventy nine for the war in the antilles on his return my uncle bought at lorient the whole cargo of a vessel just arrived from india consisting of chinese and japanese porcelains and persian cloth of all colours for the hangings of our apartments all these riches were unpacked to my great joy and arranged in the large garde meuble where the old concierge let me roam with my maid when the weather did not permit me to go out during the life of my mother the residence at hautefontaine had been very brilliant but after her death all this was completely changed my grandmother had taken possession in the absence of my father of all my mother's papers and of all the correspondence which she had preserved the fortune of my grandfather had run through her hands and all of our investments had changed in nature during the minority of my mother she was only fifteen years of age when she lost her father general de rotte who died suddenly at hautefontaine only a short time after purchasing this property he had bought the chateau in the name of his wife under the pretext that it was paid for exclusively with the funds ten thousand pounds sterling given as a dot to my grandmother by her father lord falkland my grandfather had inherited the fortune of his mother lady catherine de rotte and also that of his aunt the duchess of perth both daughters of lord middleton minister of james the second another relative had left him at paris the house in which we lived rue du bac and four thousand livres of rente upon the hotel de ville of paris these two investments were the only ones which remained at the death of monsieur de rotte when my mother came into possession my great-uncle the archbishop had lived in the house on the rue du bac for twenty years without paying a sou of rent to his niece and without even paying for the repairs when he left the house after the death of my mother and leased another he borrowed forty thousand francs on mortgage and used the money for repairs which are urgently necessary i did not know anything about this debt which i was obliged to pay myself when i sold the house in seventeen ninety seven at the death of my mother all that i received was this house in the rue du bac which was leased for ten thousand francs to the baron de stael who afterwards married the celebrated mademoiselle necker and the four thousand francs of income spoken of above i had no expectations from my father he had already spent the portion of ten thousand pounds sterling which he had inherited with the dillon regiment of which he was propriétaire né as heir of his uncles james and edward who were killed within two years of each other towards the end of the autumn of seventeen eighty two my uncle set out as usual for montpellier to preside over the states of languedoc as archbishop of napon he had this prerogative which he exercised over a period of twenty-eight years my grandmother and i remained at hautefontaine where we were very lonely when my grandmother found herself alone at hautefontaine in that grand chateau formerly so animated and brilliant when she saw the empty stables 
when she no longer heard the baying of the hounds and the horns of the hunters she became desirous of changing her mode of life and of persuading the archbishop to do the same when the archbishop returned from montpellier where he had remained only the time absolutely necessary for the meeting of the states we went to meet him at paris my father at that time was governor of the island of saint christophe which he had captured during the expedition in which his regiment had gloriously contributed to the success of the french forces in his absence my guardians represented to my great-uncle that he should no longer continue to live in my house without paying any rent or even looking after the repairs he therefore made up his mind to leave the house and as already stated borrowed on mortgage the funds necessary for the repairs about this same time my grandmother who was tired of hautefontaine bought for fifty two thousand francs a house at montfermeil near livry about five leagues from paris the price was very moderate for the land comprised ninety acres the house which was in a charming situation was named folie joyeuse it had been built by monsieur de joyeuse who had begun the construction where one ordinarily leaves off after having laid out a fine court enclosed by a railing he built at the right and left two wings terminated by two handsome square pavilions he had then found himself short of the money necessary to build the body of the house so that the only communication between the two pavilions was by a corridor at least one hundred feet long his creditors had then seized the house the park was beautiful surrounded by walls with every path terminating at a gate and all the outlets opening on the forest of bondy which was charming in this locality the furniture was brought from hautefontaine and in the spring of seventeen eighty three we were quite well established at folie joyeuse the first year no repairs were made but we passed the summer in laying out plans with architects and decorators which interested me very much End of part one chapter two part one chapter three of recollections of the revolution and the empire this is a librivox recording or librivox recordings are in the public domain seventeen eighty three to seventeen eighty six visits to languedoc in the month of november seventeen eighty three i learned that my grandmother would accompany my uncle the archbishop to the meeting of the states of languedoc this news caused me great joy at this time the annual session of the states was a very brilliant occasion peace had just been concluded and the english deprived for three years of the possibility of travelling on the continent came over in crowds as they did later in eighteen fourteen at that time people did not travel so much in italy the fine roads by mont Cenis and the Simplon and the magnificent route by the corniche constructed during the reign of napoleon were not then in existence the climate of the south of france especially that of languedoc and montpellier was very attractive the thought of this journey practically the first i had ever taken filled me with joy i will relate here once for all how we made the trip to montpellier as we went there every year until seventeen eighty six when i made my last visit we set out in a large berlin with six horses my uncle and grandmother were seated in the back with myself and the secretary of my uncle facing them and two domestics upon the box seat in front the second berlin also with six horses carried our two maids and two valets with two servants upon the box seat a chaise de poste brought the maitre d'hôtel and the chef there were also three couriers one of whom went half an hour ahead while the other two accompanied the carriages monsieur combe my instructor left several days before us by diligence every year 
the ministers kept my great uncle so long at versailles they had hardly sufficient time to arrive at montpellier by the day fixed for the opening of the states the session could not commence until the archbishop of narbonne who was president ex officio was present the delay caused by the ministers obliged us to travel as fast as possible a very disagreeable necessity at this advanced season of the year as we needed eighteen horses the order of the administration des postes preceded us by several days in order that the horses might be ready we made very long daily trips setting out at four o'clock in the morning we stopped only for dinner the chaise de poste and the first courier had preceded us by an hour this arrangement permitted us to find the table ready the fires lighted and several good dishes prepared by our chef when we arrived the chef carried with him from paris in his carriage bottles of soup and sauces all prepared and everything that was necessary to make palatable the bad meals which we found at the hotels as soon as we arrived the chaise de poste and the first courier set out so that when we halted for the night we found everything ready for us the same as at noon at that time the route which followed the course of the rhone as far as pont saint esprit was in such bad order that you ran the risk of being overturned at every moment at la Palou we entered the territory of the comte venaissin which belonged to the pope it gave me great pleasure to see the guide-post upon which was painted the tiara and the keys i felt as though we were entering italy we left the highway to marseilles and followed an excellent road which the papal government had permitted the states of languedoc to construct and which led directly to pont saint esprit at la Palou, my uncle changed his costume he put on a wadded costume of violet cloth lined with silk of the same colour silk stockings also violet in colour shoes with gold buckles his cordon bleu and a three-cornered priest's hat ornamented with gold tassels as soon as the carriage had passed the last arch of the bridge at pont saint esprit the cannon of the little citadel at the bridge head fired twenty-one shots the drums beat a salute the garrison came out the officers in full dress and all the civil and religious authorities presented themselves at the door of the berlin if it was not raining my uncle descended while they attached the eight horses destined for his carriage he listened to the harangues which they addressed to him and replied with affability and incomparable grace he was very tall with a noble face and a voice and air at the same time gracious and assured he asked for information regarding everything which might interest the inhabitants listened to the petitions which were addressed to him and the following year he still remembered the requests which had been made of him the preceding year all this lasted about a quarter of an hour after which we set out like the wind for not only had the postilions been doubled but the honour of conducting the carriage of so great a personage was warmly appreciated in the eyes of the inhabitants of languedoc the president of the states was a much greater man than the king my uncle was extremely popular although he was very haughty his arrogance was never shown except to those who were or who thought they were his superiors we spent the night at nimes where my uncle always had business one year we spent several days with the archbishop which gave me the time to see the antiquities although the monuments were not as well cared for as at present they had just commenced to clear up the rn and had brought to light several new inscriptions finally we arrived at montpellier after having travelled one hundred and sixty leagues of detestable roads after having crossed torrents without bridges where you ran the risk of your life at last we arrived at a route as fine as that of a well-kept estate we crossed superb bridges perfectly constructed we traversed cities flourishing with industry and a country which was well cultivated 
the contrast was very striking the house in which we lived at montpellier was large and beautiful but very dismal it was situated in a narrow and sombre street my uncle rented it all furnished the apartment which he occupied on the first floor contained many fine turkish rugs which were common in languedoc at that time the house surrounded the four sides of a square court one side of which was taken up by the large dining room another by a salon of the same dimensions with six windows which was hung and furnished in fine crimson damask with an immense chimney of very ancient design which to-day would be much admired my grandmother and i occupied the lower floor which was dark even at three o'clock in the afternoon we never saw my uncle in the morning we took breakfast at nine o'clock after which i went out for a walk with my english maid at three o'clock precisely it was necessary to be dressed and ready for dinner we ascended to the salon where we found fifty guests assembled every day except friday saturday my uncle always dined abroad either with the bishop or with some great personage of the states there were never any ladies present at dinner except my grandmother and myself between us were placed the guests most highly regarded when there were any strangers especially english they were seated at my side at that time every person who had a presentable domestic was served by him at table neither carafes nor glasses were placed upon the table at the large dinners there were placed upon the buffet silver buckets containing bottles of wine and a glass stand with a dozen glasses and any one who wished a glass of wine of any kind sent his servant to obtain it i had a servant attached to my person who was at the same time my coiffeur he wore my livery which we were obliged to have in red although in england it was blue because our stripes were exactly the same as those of the house of bourbon if our costumes had been blue our livery would have been exactly the same as the king's which was not allowed after dinner which never lasted more than one hour we returned to the salon which was filled with members of the states who had come for coffee nobody sat down and at the end of a half hour my grandmother and i descended to our apartment we then frequently went out to make visits in a chaise à porteur, which was the only means of transportation used in the streets of Montpellier. The fine quarter of the city which has been built since was not in existence at that epoch. On our arrival at Paris at the beginning of 1784, my father had returned from America. He had been governor of Saint-Christophe until peace had been declared after having surrendered the island to the english he had made a visit to martinique where he became strongly attached to the comtesse de la touche who was a widow at thirty years of an officer of the navy who had left her two children a boy and a girl she was very agreeable and very rich her mother madame de girardin was the sister of madame de la pagerie the mother of josephine later empress of the french at this time she had recently married her daughter to vicomte de beauharnais who had taken her with him to france madame de la touche had made her plans to go to france with her two children alexandre and betsy who was later duchesse de fitz james my father followed them to france and at this time people began to talk of their marriage on hearing the news my grandmother flew into a rage and nobody could calm her nevertheless it was very natural that my father should wish to marry again in the hope of having a son he was only thirty-three years of age and was propriétaire of one of the finest regiments of the army conducted to france by his grandfather arthur dillon this regiment had never changed its name unlike the other regiments of the irish brigade Without doubt it would have been better if he had chosen for his new wife the daughter of one of the titled Catholic families of England, but he did not like the English, and he did love Madame de la Touche. Of a very sweet and amiable character, though feeble, she had the careless and easy-going ways of the Creoles. 
the marriage took place in spite of my grandmother who made a great fuss my father wished to have me presented to my stepmother but he gave up the idea on account of the opposition of my grandmother she declared that if i ever went out of the house even for an hour to visit madame dillon i should never come back the only visit that i ever made to my stepmother was in seventeen eighty six when my father left to take the position of governor of the island of tobago my father was very much dissatisfied because he had not been named governor of martinique or of saint domingue as he had acquired the right to demand one or other of these two posts during the war he had won the greatest distinction his regiment had carried off the first success of the campaign by taking by assault the island of Grenade, of which the governor lord mccartney was his prisoner he had also powerfully contributed to the capture of the islands of saint eustache and saint christophe he was governor of this last named island for two years when he turned it over to the english at the time of the peace of seventeen eighty three the inhabitants gave him many evidences of their esteem and appreciation of which the echoes reached even to england my father received the most flattering evidences of this feeling at the time of his visit to england on his return to europe my uncle the archbishop dominated and influenced by my grandmother instead of lending his support to his nephew to aid him to obtain one of these two governorships of martinique or saint domingue did not assist him in any way my father therefore accepted the governorship of tobago here he resided until he was elected deputy of martinique to the states-general he left france accompanied by his wife and my little sister fanny who later became the wife of general bertrand he also took with him as recorder of the island my instructor monsieur combe before his departure my father talked with my grandmother of a project which he wished strongly to see carried out he had known at martinique during the war a young man who was aide-de-camp to the marquis de bouy whom the latter liked extremely and whom my father also highly appreciated my grandmother objected without giving the matter much consideration although the young man was of high birth and would be the head of his house under the pretext that he was a mauvais sujet that he had many debts and that he was small and homely i was so young that my father did not insist he sent my uncle the archbishop a procuration which gave him the power to arrange my marriage when he judged that the time had arrived however i often thought of the parti whom my father had proposed and searched for information regarding the young man my cousin dominique sheldon brought up by my grandmother and who lived with us knew him and often spoke to me of him i learned that he had had indeed a very lively youth and i made up my mind no longer to think of him in seventeen eighty five our sojourn in languedoc was much longer than usual after the session of the states we went to pass nearly a month at Arles with the amiable bishop who was later cardinal de bosset of that city this trip interested me very much it was during this sojourn at Arles that i acquired my first love for the mountains this little city situated in a charming valley surrounded by a beautiful prairie sprinkled with very old chestnut trees is in the midst of the cevennes every day we made some excursions which were really charming the young people of the country had formed a mounted guard of honour for my uncle they had adopted the english uniform of the dillons red with yellow facings they all belonged to the best families of the country to my great regret we set out to pass two months at narbonne where i had never been as i liked to be informed regarding all matters of interest in the places which i visited i began to look up the histories of narbonne from the time of caesar to that of cardinal de richelieu who had formerly occupied the archiepiscopal chateau which was similar to a stronghold of the middle ages 
From La Bonne we went to Toulouse by way of saint Popul, where we remained several days. From there we went to Bordeaux, where we made a visit of seventeen days with the Archbishop. I cannot say why Bordeaux interested me more than the other cities which we had visited. Here we saw Madame Dillon, mother of all those Dillons who have always pretended, but wrongly, to be our relatives. This lady, who was of good English family, had married an Irish merchant named Dillon, whose ancestors had probably come from that part of Ireland named, until the reign of Queen Elizabeth, Dillon's country, where a great number of the inhabitants, the same as in Scotland, took the name of their lord. However this may be, this Dillon had no success in business, and having raised a certain sum of money, came to establish himself at Bordeaux, where he entered into commerce. His wife was a woman of extraordinary beauty, well known throughout the province. Her husband died, leaving her with twelve children and very little fortune, but possessed of great charms and much courage. Maréchal de Richelieu befriended her and recommended her to my uncle at the time of one of his trips to Bordeaux. My uncle promised to look after her children and kept his word. The three eldest, who were rather beautiful girls, made very favourable marriages. The nine sons, who were without exception fine fellows, all had the most honourable careers. At Bordeaux, several days before my departure, my servant, when dressing my hair, asked my permission to go that evening to a chateau situated at a short distance to see some old comrades. He rejoined our carriages at the passage of the Dordogne at Cubsac, not far from the chateau which he had visited. I asked the name of the place, and he told me that it was called Le Buguil, and it belonged to the Comte de la Tour du Pin. His son was the young man whom my father had wished me to marry, and whom my grandmother had refused. I asked the servant regarding the position of the chateau, and learned with regret that it could not be seen from the highway. I was very much interested in crossing the river at Cubsac to learn that the land around belonged to Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, and I said to myself that perhaps I might some day be the lady of all this fine country. I took good care, however, not to communicate these reflections to my grandmother, who would not have received them with pleasure. Nevertheless, they remained in the back of my head. End of Part 1 Chapter 3part 1 chapter 4 of recollections of the revolution and the empire this is a librivox recording or librivox recordings are in the public domain 1786 matrimonial projects at the time of our return to paris i was 16 years of age and my grandmother informed me that she was trying to arrange a marriage for me with the marquis adrien de laval he had just become the head of his family by the death of his brother, who left a widow, twenty years of age, but no children. The Duchesse de Laval, the mother of Adrienne, had been a great friend of my mother's. She was very desirous of seeing this marriage brought about, and it was equally agreeable to me. The name of Laval Montmorency sounded very agreeably in my aristocratic ears. Young Laval had left the Seminaire to enter the army at the death of his brother. Our fathers were also closely associated, but the principal reason which led me to wish this marriage was that I should be able to leave the house of my grandmother. I was no longer a child. My education had commenced at so early an age that at sixteen I was as old as other girls at twenty-five. With my grandmother I led a wretched life. I was very miserable and ardently desired to end this unhappy position. Nevertheless, being in the habit of reflecting upon my fate, I had resolved never to accept out of spite a marriage which would not be en rapport with my situation in the world. I was considered to be the sole heir of my grandmother, who had the reputation of being rich, was so in reality 
the fine estate of haute fontaine situated about twenty-two leagues from paris with a revenue of fifty thousand francs from the farms without counting the woods the lakes and the fields a pretty house which she had just purchased about five leagues from paris and where my uncle was making extensive repairs with rentes upon the hotel de ville of paris which she would give me at the time of my marriage an immense amount of personal property all this was assured to me since my grandmother was sixty years of age when i was sixteen who would ever have suspected that my uncle with over four hundred thousand francs of income was in financial difficulties and had persuaded my grandmother to borrow in order to come to his rescue all the men who wished to marry me were blinded by these fine appearances it was also known that at the time of my marriage i would have the position of dame du palais of the queen this at that time weighed heavily in the balance in the grand monde etre à la cour sounded very fine the dames du palais were only twelve in number my mother had been one because the queen personally loved her tenderly because she was the daughter-in-law of a peer of england and the granddaughter of another lord falkland finally because my father a distinguished officer was counted among very few who could become marshals of france of the three regiments of the irish brigade dillon and berwick were the only ones which had preserved their names i remember that when monsieur walsh was named colonel of the regiment which took his name monsieur de fitz james and my father showed a great deal of discontent on the pretext that he did not belong to any great irish or english family the duchesse de fitz james mademoiselle de tirard was dame du palais like my mother and a woman of the same age but her husband the third duc de fitz james who was the grandson of marechal de berwick and the son of the second duke who had also been marechal de france enjoyed a very mediocre military reputation well, my father had greatly distinguished himself during the war which had just finished at the age of twenty-seven he had been named brigadier a grade since suppressed which represented the rank intermediate between the grade of colonel and that of lieutenant-general to return to myself i was then what would be called from every point of view a good match and since i am on the subject of my personal advantages i think this is the place to trace my portrait it will not be very attractive on paper because i owed my reputation for beauty only to my figure my general appearance and not at all to my features i had a mass of light blonde hair small grey eyes with very few eyelashes most of which i had lost through a severe attack of smallpox at the age of four i had thin blonde eyebrows a high forehead and a nose which was said to be greek but which was long and too large at the end my finest feature was my mouth with very fresh lips chiselled like those of an antique statue and beautiful teeth which i have preserved intact at the age of seventy-one it was said that my face was agreeable that i had a gracious smile and notwithstanding all this i could be considered plain however a large and beautiful figure and a clear and transparent complexion with a great deal of colour gave me a marked superiority in all gatherings especially by day and it was certain that i outshone many women apparently endowed with superior advantages at the state dinners given frequently by my uncle during the summers that we passed at paris i often saw marechal de biron the last grand seigneur of the time of louis the fourteenth although he was eighty-five years of age while i was only fifteen he had taken a great fancy to me he had me seated at table beside him and had the kindness to talk with me at paris he had a large and beautiful mansion now that of the sacre coeur with a splendid garden of three or four acres where there were hothouses filled with rare plants 
it was considered a particular honour to be received at his house one day in speaking with my uncle he said if i should have the misfortune to lose madame la marechale de biron i would pray mademoiselle dillon to take my name and to permit me to put my fortune at her feet he never had this misfortune however which he would easily have consoled himself his wife survived him and perished upon the scaffold with her niece the duchesse de biron the marechal died in seventeen eighty seven or seventeen eighty eight and had a magnificent funeral it was the last splendour of the monarchy my marriage with adrien de laval fell through because the marechal de laval his grandfather chose for his wife mademoiselle de luxembourg he married her when he was almost a child and when she herself was hardly eighteen years of age i regretted this on account of the name my grandmother then proposed to me the name of the vicomte de fleury with whom i did not wish to have anything to do his reputation was bad he had neither esprit nor distinction and he also belonged to the younger branch of a house without any great reputation i therefore refused him the next candidate was esperance de l'aigle of whom i had seen a great deal during our youth i did not think that his name was sufficiently illustrious my decision was perhaps unreasonable as he was really a very good match who belonged to the same circle in society the estate of his father was situated only six or seven leagues from hautefontaine all these facts were in favour of our union nevertheless i refused him marriages are made in heaven i had taken it into my head to marry the comte de gouvernet notwithstanding the fact that i had never seen him and every one spoke badly of him i knew that he was small and plain that he gambled and contracted debts nevertheless my resolution was made i told my cousin sheldon that i would marry no one else he attempted but without success to reason me out of what he called my folly in the month of november seventeen eighty six we were just about to set out for languedoc when one morning my grandmother said this monsieur gouvernet continues to come back with his proposals of marriage madame de montconseil his grandmother is endeavouring to get the best of us on all sides his father is commandant of a province and will be marshal of france he is a man who enjoys the highest consideration in the army the queen herself desires it for the princesse denine the daughter of madame de montconseil has spoken to her about it therefore think and decide about it to which i replied without hesitation i have made up my mind i do not ask for anything better my grandmother was stupefied she hoped to think that i would refuse him she could not conceive why i should prefer him to monsieur de l'aigle in reality i could not have told why myself it was an instinct an impulse coming from heaven god had destined me for him we set out for montpellier without any further talk on the subject of this marriage one morning my grandmother informed me that my uncle had received a charming letter from madame de montconseil that she extremely desired my marriage with her grandson for whom she had the warmest affection that she would do everything in her power to bring about our union but that she was not on good terms with her son-in-law the comte de la tour du pin who did not get on well with his wife and had not lived with her for many years this was the first time i had heard of this family trouble although they did not live together they were not legally separated as the family had wished to avoid scandal on account of the princesse denine the sister of madame de la tour du pain and also on account of her daughter the marquise de lamette the marquise de montconseil was then eighty-five years of age but was still considered beautiful her husband who was an officer like nearly all the gentlemen of that epoch had married her very young he had been a page of louis the fourteenth 
and had a very lively and dissipated youth. He had served in all the wars at the end of the reign of Louis the Fourteenth and in those of Louis the Fifteenth. At the age of forty, Monsieur de Montconseil left the service and retired to his estate of Tesson in Saintonge. Here he spent most of his life until his death at the age of ninety. He had a fine house at Saintes, where he passed three months during the winter. The rest of the year he lived at Tesson, where he himself laid out and planted the park and gardens. Occasionally he went to Paris to see his wife, who had a very fine mansion. He was very fond of his grandson, who frequently visited him at Tesson. End of Part 1 Chapter 4Part one chapter five of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Seventeen eighty seven. The Marriage Preliminaries. The last trip which I made to Montpellier during the winter of seventeen eighty six and seventeen eighty seven was to me the most brilliant of all. Nevertheless, I was very desirous of returning to Paris, where my fate was to be decided. We set out sooner than I had expected. My uncle had promised this year to visit Marseille and Toulon before I returned to Paris. I was rejoicing at this arrangement when a courier arrived with the news of the convocation of the first assembly of the notables, of which my uncle was a member. It was necessary, therefore, to set out for Paris the day after the closing of the session of the States and to give up our visit to Marseille and Toulon. My uncle, who was not feeling very well, wished to spend the night at Fontainebleau, so that he might not be too fatigued on his arrival at Paris, and be able to go the next morning to Versailles. We always found our house ready for us, as though we had not left it at all. The evening of our arrival there were several visitors, among whom was a fat German named Comte de Bentheim, whose wife was a friend of my grandmother's. My uncle at once asked him the news of Paris. He replied, Madame de Montconseil is dead. I turned pale, and my uncle, noticing my agitation, said to me in English that this would not in any way change our plans. For several days I heard nothing except conversation regarding the death of this Madame de Montconseil, of the grief of her daughter Madame de Nines, and of her grandson, Monsieur de Gouvernet, who had taken care of her in an admirable manner. Monsieur de Gouvernet, in the absence of his father, took occasion at once to notify my uncle that the loss of his grandmother would in no way change his desire for his union with our family. He demanded permission of my uncle to go to his father and tell him personally that his demand for my hand would be satisfactory to me and my family. Upon the affirmative response of my great-uncle, he immediately set out for Bordeaux. Before the week was over, he had returned from Beuil, where he had talked with his father, and had arranged to have him write a letter to make a formal demand for my hand. It was settled that he should present himself the following morning at my grandmother's house, but that he was not to see me until after the articles were signed, which was the usage at that time. This memorable morning I hid myself behind a curtain, and saw Monsieur de Gouvernet descend from his carriage and enter the house. He remained a quarter of an hour, and it was arranged that the article should be signed as soon as they could be drawn up by the notary. The arrangements were not terminated before the end of the week, and in the meantime Madame Denin paid a visit to my grandmother. She asked to see me, as I had expected. I was so much afraid of this grande dame, so elegant and imposing, who was going to examine me from head to foot, that I could hardly control myself on entering the room. She took my hand and kissed me, and then exclaimed, Ah, oh, la belle taille, elle est charmante, mon neveu est bien heureux. This visit took place, I think, the eve of the day on which the articles were to be signed. It was not customary for the young lady to be present at the reading of the articles, 
but as soon as this was over i was sent for i was placed beside madame d'Henin and my aunt lady jerningham who took pity on my embarrassment my toilette was very simple i had requested my grandmother to let me order it myself at that time the gowns which were worn were laced behind and plainly indicated the figure they were therefore called sheaths fourreaux. my robe was of white gauze without any ornaments with a sash of dark blue ribbon with fringed ends of brilliant english silk from this time on m de gouvernet came every day for dinner or supper either at paris or at versailles where my uncle was established since the commencement of the meeting of the notables my grandmother and i remained at paris but every day at one thirty we set out for versailles where we arrived for dinner at three o'clock m de gouvernet had presented to my uncle his brother-in-law the marquis de lamette and two brothers of the latter charles and alexandre the fourth brother theodore whom i knew later was not there at the time finally the meeting of the notables ended and my uncle returned to paris where the day of the signature of the contract was arranged for the first of may i do not now recall the details of my toilette but i think that it must have been rose or blue for the white robe was reserved for the day of marriage a few days previously i had made the acquaintance of my future father-in-law the comte de la tour du pin he was a little man but very erect very well built and had been handsome in his youth he had admirable teeth fine eyes an air of assurance and a charming smile he had served during the seven years war as colonel of the regiment called les grenadiers de france which was composed of the elite of all the other regiments the queen who approved of my marriage expressed the desire to see me and asked my uncle to bring me to her together with madame denin the day of my visit at versailles i found myself in the presence of the queen without really knowing how i got there she kissed me and i kissed her hand she made me sit down beside her and asked me a thousand questions regarding my education and so on but i was too embarrassed to reply finally taking pity upon my diffidence the queen talked with my uncle and madame denin i am afraid that my timidity made an unfavourable impression on the queen which was perhaps never effaced we went to montfermeil about the eighth or tenth of the month of may seventeen eighty seven as it was not the etiquette of the time for the futur to sleep under the same roof with the young lady whom he was to marry m de gouvernet came every day from paris for dinner and remained until after supper in the vast wardrobes had been brought together the fine trousseau which my grandmother had given me the price of which exceeded forty five thousand francs it was composed of linens laces and muslin dresses it was not a single silk dress the corbeil which had been given me by monsieur de gouvernet comprised jewels ribbons flowers feathers and so on the present of madame denis was a charming tea service of silver gilt complete in every respect with sevres porcelain i think that this gave me more pleasure than anything else my grandfather viscount dillon sent me a pair of earrings which cost ten thousand francs i had also received from monsieur de gouvernet a fine collection of english and italian books also of english engravings for which i was very grateful end of part one chapter five Part one chapter six of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire This is a Librivox recording or Librivox recordings are in the public domain seventeen eighty nine Marriage and Presentation at Court I would like to have the power of depicting the manners of the times of my youth, of which many details have escaped my memory and 
the occasion of this marriage in high society at which figured so many personages men and women the day of my marriage everybody was present in the salon at noon the company was composed on my side of my grandmother madame de Rotte, my great-uncle the archbishop of narbonne my aunt lady jerningham her husband sir william jerningham their daughter and eldest son who was afterwards lord stafford also of the Mrs. Sheldon and their elder brother, Monsieur Constable, my first witness, and the Chevalier Jerningham, brother of Sir William Jerningham, who was a friend of my mother and of myself, my second witness. This was all of my family. The guests included all the ministers, the archbishops of Paris and Toulouse, Monsieur de Lally Tolondal, of whom I shall speak later, and several other persons whose names escape me. The Comte de Gouvernet was born in Paris, Rue de Varennes, at the hotel of his parents, 6th of January, 1759. At the age of 16 years, he entered the military service as a second lieutenant of artillery, and two years later was promoted to be captain of cavalry. In 1779, he was appointed aide-de-camp of the Marquis de Bouillé, governor of the Antilles, and served under his orders during the last three years of the war in America. During his absence, he was promoted to be colonel en seconde of the Royal Comte Infanterie, and was still serving with this regiment at the time of our marriage, 21st of May, 1787. The family of Monsieur de Gouvernet was composed of his father and mother, of his uncle, l'abbé de Gouvernet, of his sister, the Marquise de Lamette, of her husband and his three brothers, Charles, Alexandre and Théodore de Lamette, also of Madame Denis, his aunt, and of a number of other persons, fifty or sixty in all. In going to the chapel, we passed through the court, I walked first, giving my hand to my cousin, young Jerningham. My grandmother followed with Monsieur de Gouvernet, and the rest in order. At the altar we found my uncle and the Archbishop of Paris. After a low mass, which was said by the curé of Montfermé, my uncle gave us the nuptial benediction, after having pronounced a very fine discourse. All the ladies then embraced me in the order of relationship and age. After this, the valet de chambre brought a large basket containing the wedding souvenirs, consisting of sword knots for the men, costing from twenty-five to thirty francs each, and of fans for the ladies of different prices, from twenty-five to one hundred francs. This custom was very expensive. Let us not forget the toilette of the bride, which was very simple. I had a dress of white crepe trimmed with Brussels lace. As veils were not then in vogue, I wore pinners, that is to say, a headdress having long flaps hanging down the sides of my cheeks. I had a sprig of orange blossoms on my head and a bouquet at my side. For the dinner, which was not served until four o'clock, I put on a pretty toque with white plumes to which was attached the sprig of orange blossoms. In the evening, a fine concert ended the day. The following day, the greater part of the guests left us. I was married on Monday, and the next day, Madame Denis informed me of the desire of the Queen that my presentation should take place the Sunday following. Madame Denis added that I ought to accompany her to Paris on Thursday morning to take two lessons of courtesies, révérence, of my dancing master, also to try on my presentation costume. I therefore set out the following morning for Paris in company with my aunt, Madame Denis, and passed the two following mornings with Monsieur Huard, my dancing master. You cannot imagine anything more ridiculous than this rehearsal of the presentation. Monsieur Huard, the fat man, admirably coiffé and powdered, wearing a full skirt, 
represented the Queen, and stood at the end of the salon. He dictated to me what I should do. At one moment personifying the lady who presented me, the next returning to the place of the Queen, in order to indicate the moment when, taking off my glove and bending to kiss the bottom of her robe, she would make the gesture of preventing me from so doing. Nothing was forgotten or neglected in this rehearsal, which was prolonged over a period of three or four hours. My hair was dressed simply, and I wore an ordinary morning costume, over which I had put on a court dress with a large pannier. It was a regular comedy. Sunday morning after the Mass, my presentation took place. I was in full court dress, grand corps, that is to say, with a corsage expressly made, without shoulder straps, laced in the back, but so narrow that the lacings four fingers wide at the bottom revealed a chemise of the finest batiste. This chemise had very short sleeves and no straps, so as to leave the shoulders bare. The top of the arm was covered with three or four rows of white lace falling to the elbow. The neck and shoulders were entirely uncovered. Seven or eight strands of large diamonds which the Queen had wished to lend me partially concealed my own. The front of the corsage had the appearance of being laced with rows of diamonds. I also had a number on my head in the form of an aigrette. Thanks to the good lessons of Monsieur Huard, I had no trouble with the three courtesies, and took off and put on my glove without too much awkwardness. After this I received the accolade of the King, of the Princess his brothers, the Comte de Provence, afterwards Louis the Eighteenth, and the Comte d'Artois, afterwards Charles the Tenth, of the Princess of Condé, Bourbon, and Donguin. By a piece of good luck, for which I have often thanked Heaven, the Duc de Léon was not at Versailles the day of my presentation, and I therefore avoided being kissed by this monster. The following Sunday I returned to Versailles, and from that time on went there nearly every week with my aunt. Although the Queen had decided that I should be appointed Dame du Palais only at the end of two years, I was already considered as one, and exercised the functions of the position every Sunday. It will be interesting, perhaps, to describe the ceremonial of the Sunday court in which shone at the time the unfortunate Queen, as etiquette has changed, and these details have entered into the domain of history. The suite of rooms occupied by the Queen, known as the Grand Appartement de la Reine, immediately adjoined the Salon de la Paix, which was situated at the southwest corner of the main front of the palace, looking out on the gardens. This suite consisted of three rooms, the Queen's bedchamber, the Salon, and the antechamber, which was also known as the Salon du Grand Couvert. Just beyond was the Queen's guardroom, which was invaded by the populace the night of the 6th of October, 1789. Adjoining this suite were the cabinet de Marie-Antoinette, frequently called the Petit Appartement de la Reine, consisting of a boudoir, library and salon. All of these rooms were extremely small, but remarkable for the charm of the decoration. They were lighted by small interior courts, on the other side of which were the king's guard-room and his first antechamber. At a few minutes before noon, the ladies entered the salon which preceded the queen's bedchamber. No one sat down except a few aged ladies. There were always at least forty present and sometimes more. Ordinarily, the Princesse de Lombal, the superintendent of the house, arrived and entered immediately into the Queen's room, where she was making her toilette. The Princesse de Chimay, the sister-in-law of my aunt Denine, and the Comtesse d'Ossin, 
one a lady of honour and the other lady of the bedchamber, also had the entrees. At the end of several minutes, an usher advanced to the door of the chamber and called in a loud voice, Le service. Then the dame du palais for the week, four in number, and other young ladies like myself designated later on to form part of the service, also entered. As soon as the Queen had said good morning to all in turn, with much grace and kindness, the door was opened and everybody entered. This audience was prolonged until twenty minutes before one. Then the door was opened and the usher announced the King. The Queen, always dressed in court costume, advanced towards him with a charming and respectful air. The King nodded to right and left, spoke to some ladies whom he knew, but never to the young ones. He was so short-sighted that he could not recognise anyone at three paces. He was a fat man of medium height, with high shoulders, and the worst form that you could imagine. He had the air of a peasant, and there was nothing lofty or royal in his mien. He was always embarrassed by his sword, and did not know what to do with his hat. His costume, which was very magnificent, was highly embroidered, and ornamented with the star of the Saint Esprit in diamonds. He never wore the cordon over his costume except his fete day and the days of gala and great ceremony. A quarter before one was the time set to go to the mass. The king and queen walked side by side, slowly enough to say a word in passing to the numerous courtiers who lined the gallery. The Queen often spoke to strangers who had been presented to her, to artists and to men of letters. Behind came the ladies in the order of their rank. It was a great art to know how to walk in these vast apartments without stepping on the long train of the lady who preceded you. You could not raise your foot at all, but had to glide it along the floor, which was always very slippery until you had passed through the Salon d'Hercule. After this, you threw the bottom of your robe over one side of your pannier, and having caught the eye of your lackey, who awaited you with a large hassock of red velvet trimmed with golden fringe, you rushed down one of the aisles at the right or left of the chapel in the endeavour to obtain a place as near as possible to the tribune occupied by the royal family. Your lackey put the hassock before you, and you took your prayer book, in which you hardly ever read, for by the time you were in your place, and had arranged the train of your dress, and had knelt upon this immense hassock, the mass was already half finished. As soon as the service was over, the Queen made a profound reverence to the King, and then the march back began in the same order in which we had come. Everyone returned to the Queen's chamber and chatted while awaiting the dinner hour. At this time, during a period of a quarter of an hour, the King and Queen received the ladies who had come from Paris. We impertinent young things used to call these ladies the traineuses, because they had the skirts of their court costumes so long that you could not see their ankles. Dinner was served in the first salon, where a small rectangular table was set with two covers, and two large green armchairs were placed, one beside the other, touching, with backs so high as to entirely conceal the persons occupying them. The Queen sat at the left of the King. They turned their backs to the chimney, and before them, at a distance of ten feet, was arranged in a circle a line of stools upon which were seated the duchesses, princesses, and ladies of high rank, who had the privilege of the tabouret. Behind them stood the other ladies, facing the king and queen. The king ate with good appetite, but the queen did not take off her gloves or unfold her serviette, which was a great mistake on her part. As soon as the king had drunk, we had the privilege of leaving. 
after having made a courtesy. We regained our apartments very much fatigued, and remained quietly in our rooms so as not to disturb our coiffure, especially when we had had our hair dressed by Leonor, the most famous of coiffeurs. The private dinners were served at three o'clock, which at this time was the elegant hour. The Minister of War, Maréchal de Ségur, who had been present at my marriage, had given my husband a month's leave of absence. So instead of leaving for Saint-Omer, where his regiment was in garrison, he remained with me at Montfermeil. At the end of the month of June, it was necessary for him to return to his post, and I saw him leave with real chagrin. About the middle of August, he came to pass a week at Montfermeil. The Maréchal had consented to this escapade, on condition that he should not go to Paris. The colonels in garrison in Flanders were then threatened with the necessity of passing the autumn and winter months with their regiments, on account of the troubles in Holland, in which it seemed that we should be obliged to interfere. But the indecision of the king and the feebleness of the government did not permit us to take part, which was a great mistake, as it might have turned public opinion from the revolutionary ideas which were beginning to germinate in the heads of the French people. End of part one, chapter six. Part one, chapter seven of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1787-1788, first season in society. My sister-in-law, Madame de Lamette, for whom I had conceived the most tender friendship, had been kept at Paris by the illness of her youngest son until the month of October, 1787. As the colonels were still with their regiments and not able to return, my sister-in-law proposed to me the first of October that I should accompany her to the country. My husband could then rejoin us, as his regiment was in garrison at Saint-Omer, a short distance from Enoncourt, between Amiens and Arras. The difficulty was to arrange this trip with my grandmother, who in the absence of my husband had again assumed her authority over me. Neither I nor my sister-in-law had the courage to make the proposition to her. We therefore devised the scheme of having the request made by my husband himself. On the appointed day, the letter arrived, and my grandmother, without preamble, brusquely demanded, When are you going to leave? To which I replied, trembling, that my sister-in-law awaited me. Accordingly, we set out together. Our maids were in my carriage, Madame de Lamette, her two children, and myself in her carriage. I have preserved the most charming recollections of this trip. We went to Lille to see the Marquis de Lamette, my brother-in-law, who was there with his regiment. I had never had so much pleasure as during this short journey. With my husband I visited all the establishments, military and civil. When it was finally decided that France should abandon the Holland patriots to their unfortunate fate, Permission was given the colonels to return to Paris. My husband and I therefore set out for Montfermeil, while my sister-in-law remained in the country until the beginning of winter. Soon after my return, my uncle and grandmother left for Montpellier. It had been arranged that during the absence of my relatives we should live with our aunt, Madame de Nîmes. As she was to introduce me to society, this arrangement was agreeable and convenient. It was not then customary for a young lady to appear alone in public the first year of her marriage. When she went out in the morning to pay visits or shop, she always took a maid with her in her carriage. Certain old dames carried this rigorism so far as to blame those who went out even with their husbands for a promenade in the Champs-Élysées or the Tuileries Gardens.
and thought in such cases they should be followed by a lackey in livery. My husband considered this custom insupportable, and we never submitted to this etiquette. Once established with my aunt, we found ourselves much happier and more tranquil than with my grandmother. Nearly every evening we went to the theatre, where the performances then ended early enough to permit us going to supper afterwards. My aunt and I had permission to occupy the Queen's boxes. This was a favour which was accorded to only six or eight of the youngest ladies of the palace. She had a loge at the Opera, at the Comédie Française, and at the theatre then called the Comédie Italienne, where Opera Comique was given in French. We had only to read the daily papers to make our choice between the different theatres. These stage boxes were furnished like elegant salons, Every box had a large antechamber, well heated and lighted, and a private staircase communicated with the antechamber where the servants remained. At the entrance was a porter in the king's livery. You never had to wait a moment for your carriage. Generally, we went to the Comédie Italienne for the first piece, which was always the best, and to the opera for the ballet. Since I am now established with my aunt, this is the moment to speak of the society in which she moved, which was the most elegant and the most highly considered in Paris, and by which I was adopted the first year I was out. This clique was composed of four very distinguished ladies, joined together from their youth by a friendship which in their eyes represented a sort of religion, and which was perhaps the only one that they possessed. These four ladies, very highly esteemed on account of their rank in the world, were, besides Madame de Nines, the Princesse de Poix, the Duchesse de Biron, and the Princesse de Bouillon. At the time of my marriage, my aunt, Madame de Nines, was thirty-eight years of age. She had espoused at the age of fifteen the Prince de Nines, younger brother of the Prince de Chimé, who was only seventeen. They were admired as the handsomest couple who had ever appeared at court. The second year of her marriage, Madame de Nines had an attack of smallpox, and this malady, which they did not then know how to treat properly, left upon her face an eruption which was never cured. However, she was still very beautiful when I knew her, with fine hair, charming eyes, teeth like pearls, a superb figure, and a very noble air. Until the death of her mother, she resided with her. Monsieur Dendine had an apartment in the house of Madame de Montconseil, but although he was not judicially separated from his wife, he nevertheless resided apart with an actress of the Comédie Française, who was ruining him. The court, justified by its indifference, these kind of liaisons, it was laughed at as the most simple thing in the world. At that time, the ladies of high society were marked by the audacity with which they made a parade of their love affairs. These intrigues were known almost as soon as formed, and when they were durable, they acquired a sort of consideration. In the society of les princesses combinées, as they were called, there were exceptions, however, to these blamable customs. Madame de Poix, who was deformed, lame, and crippled a great part of the year, had never been accused of any intrigues. When I first knew her, she still had a charming face, although forty years of age. She was the most amiable person in the world. Madame de Lausanne, who was later Duchesse de Biron, after the death of my respectful admirer, the Marshal of that name, was an angel of kindness and goodness. After the death of the Maréchal de Luxembourg, her grandmother, with whom she had lived, and who kept the finest house in Paris, she had bought an hôtel, Rue de Bourbon, looking out on the river. This she had arranged with simple elegance, in harmony with her handsome fortune and the modesty of her character. She lived here alone, 
for her husband following the example of monsieur denin passed his time with an actress of the comedie francaise since the death of his mother whose happy influence had kept him in good company he had mixed with the habitue of the duc d'orleans egalite who corrupted all who approached him the duchesse de lausanne had a very curious library with many manuscripts of rousseau among others that of la nouvelle heloise entirely written in his own hand also a quantity of letters and notes which he had written to madame de luxembourg the princesse de bouillon had married when very young the last duc de bouillon who was an imbecile and a cripple she lived with him in the hotel de bouillon upon the quai malaquais he was never seen because he remained always in his apartment with the persons who looked after him during the summer he went to his place at navarre the fine estate which later belonged to the empress josephine but i think that madame de bouillon never went there she was a person of great spirit and charm and i think was the most distinguished of my acquaintances at no time could she have been pretty she was exceedingly thin, almost a skeleton, with a flat German face, retrousse nose, wretched teeth, and yellow hair. With all this, she had so much esprit, such original ideas, and her conversation was so amusing that she attracted and enchanted everybody. Her kindness to me was very great, and I was quite proud of it. Nevertheless, this homely and spirituelle princess had had one or several lovers. She was bringing up a little girl who in a striking manner resembled her as well as the Prince Emmanuel de Sam Sam. He passed for being the lover whom she had adopted for life, but certainly at that time he was only a friend. A very tall man, as thin as his mistress, he always appeared to me to be insipid although he was said to be learned i would like to believe that but he hid his treasures and i cannot recall anything of his conversation the chevalier de coigny brother of the duke who was first equerry of the king was supposed before the time of my marriage to be the lover of my aunt at least he had that reputation later on he formed a strong attachment for madame de Monsange wife of the fermier general and mother of the charming comtesse etienne dufour whom he afterwards married i was very fond of this fat chevalier who was of so gay and amiable a nature as he was fifty years of age i talked with him as often as possible he recounted to me a thousand anecdotes which i remembered and which perhaps would be amusing if i were to relate them destined to live in that grand monde and at the court i listened with interest to his recitals for a knowledge of past times was useful to me a mansion which we all visited and where i was received with the most affectionate familiarity was that of madame de montesson she loved my husband like a son after the death of his grandmother madame de montconseil he had lived there until the day of his marriage she received me with extreme kindness. I was also bound by ties of friendship to Madame de Valence, the daughter of her niece, Madame de Jonis. Madame de Valence was three years older than myself and was then considered a model young woman. It is well known that Madame de Montesson was the legitimate wife of the Duc d'Orléans, the father of Philippe Egalité, to whom she had been married by the Archbishop of Toulouse. The king was unwilling to recognise this marriage, and she ceased to visit the court. The Duc d'Orléans gave up his residence at the Palais Royal to establish himself in a house, Rue de Provence, adjoining that which Madame de Montesson had bought in the Chaussée d'Antin. The separating walls were torn down, and the two gardens were united. The Duke always kept his separate entrance, Rue de Provence, with a Swiss in his livery, 
for madame de montesson also had her private entrance but the courts remained connected the house of madame de montesson bore a very good reputation she saw the best company in paris and the most distinguished from the oldest sets to the youngest she no longer gave large parties as during the life of the duc d'orleans which i much regretted she immediately adopted me for a daughter and from her great experience in the world her conversation and her counsels were very useful to me hardly a day passed without my visiting madame de valence and often when the hour was advanced madame de montesson kept me for dinner on her return to paris my grandmother came to see me she soon learned from my conversation of my success in the world and the fine reception which i had received from a large number of persons whom she disliked from this moment i think she resolved to seize the first occasion which presented itself to oblige us to leave my uncle's house nevertheless for the moment i returned to the hotel dillon where they had arranged for me a charming apartment in the Monsards, which was reached unfortunately by a small turning staircase i do not remember the circumstances which finally led to the rupture with my relatives after several months of repeated quarrels my grandmother requested us to leave her house in spite of my tears and the intervention of my uncle the archbishop whose affection we had gained but who feared my grandmother too much to offer any opposition we were obliged to leave the hotel dillon never to return this was about the month of june 1788 my aunt received us at her house with great kindness it was nevertheless a great chagrin for me to be separated from my family this epoch was one of the most painful of my life it was the first real grief that i had ever known and the remembrance of it is still painful to me though i cannot in any way reproach myself for having provoked it end of part one chapter seven